Hey everyone, I'm Jack with River Jack Studio, and this is project number three, making a tea tray. We're going to start out with some beauty shots of me getting a couple pieces of lumber out of the attic. Unfortunately, I have a shop the size of a one-car garage and no room to put any boards anywhere, so up in the attic they go, which <laughs> makes things interesting sometimes. The boards weren't long enough to put them on the ground, so I just kind of shimmed them up against the ladder and uh, hope they wouldn't fall down to the ground whenever I got down. I just ended up grabbing a large board of purple heart I had and some spalted maple while I was up there. I took the maple over to my table saw and cut several quarter inch pieces that would be used for the bottom part of the tray. I absolutely destroyed my push stick when I was trying to push all these through because I didn't realize it was larger than a quarter inch. So I decided just to get some plywood and cut a V into it. And that's what I kind of used to push everything through, which surprisingly worked really well. Um, I ended up using that entire piece of maple for the tray. And I ended up sorting through all the pieces and just selected three sets of book match ones that looked really good to use for the bottom. I then went ahead and grabbed that piece of purple heart and using a jigsaw I cut off about a 15 inch piece so I could use it for both the bottom of the tray and later the sides. The blades for my jigsaw took absolutely forever to get through. They were rough cut ones from Festool and they were plenty long enough to get through the piece but uh, that clip was sped up by about 600% so I don't know if I got some defects from the factory or what but I gotta look around for some better jigsaw blades. I then took the pieces over to my table saw, cut them for the bottom of the tray. Um, one side had a lot of curl to the grain so I decided to end up cutting that piece in half and using it in my tray. I set up my clamps and took my spalted pieces over and oriented them to where they were book matched and separated those three sets by strips of purple heart. Since this piece was only uh, a sixteenth over a quarter inch, I made sure to use calls and clamp everything really well. Um, I didn't want there to be any deviation between the pieces, as I had really little wiggle room to work with. So the purple heart I had bought from a lumber yard in Baghdad, Kentucky, which is just a little bit east of Louisville. Purple heart is not native to here, but it is to Mexico and farther south to Central and South America. The spalted maple, however, is from a horse pasture in Kentucky that was a sugar maple tree that had fallen down in a friend's horse field, and the horses had actually eaten all the leaves off the tree by the time I got to it, and we cut it up out of the field, and I had kept a couple pieces for myself, and since it had sat there for about six months, it had uh, started to spalt a little bit. Those black streaks that you can see in the wood come from a fungus that decomposes the organic material in the wood and replaces it with mineral deposits that give it that deep dark coloration. And that's actually what the spalting is. So for my glue up, I used Type Bond 3 as it's waterproof and it being a tea tray or a serving tray, it had potential to get uh, moisture on the top. So I decided that was the best call. I then let the glue sit for 24 hours and came back and undid all my clamps. Even though I tried to wipe off as much excess glue as possible before I put the calls and clamps on, uh, it still does get glued to the piece sometimes, and I just very lightly and nervously took a dead blow hammer and knocked the calls off. I should be putting painter's tape over them so they don't stick, but it always seems like I'm in a hurry. <laughs> I'd rather use a hammer than tape. I then took a chisel and got as much of the excess dried glue that I could off the pieces and any of the remains of the calls that had stuck to it before sending it through the planer. Because the piece was so thin, I ended up gluing it down to a flat sheet of plywood so the planer wouldn't destroy it. I adjusted it to only take about a 30 second off at a time and made two very light passes on each side. Then moving on to flattening one side of the board on the joiner, and again only to take about a 30 second off on each pass. Uh, the other side I squared up on my table saw to make sure I had a perfectly equal distance on, on both sides. Then flipping it around and using my miter gaze to trim the end off, using the fence on the other side to make sure I had a perfectly square bottom tray. Due to the maple spalting, that does mean it started to break down, and that often leads to soft spots. 
obviously we don't want that in our final product, so I go ahead and go through with the pick and get out any of the soft spots or rotten pieces of maple. I then use a CA glue with an accelerator. It only takes about 10 seconds for it to dry and be workable. Then I sand it down the CA glue and go over everything a couple of times. I really like using CA glue. It's really useful to fill voids in any piece and fix ex-girlfriend's cabinets when they lean on them a little too hard. But uh, I always manage to get some on my hands. And then using the accelerator, I have super glued fingers the rest of the day. So that's not a fun part to it. But I go ahead and pre-sand everything as it'll be less work later on if I go ahead and do everything now before it's glued up. I spray down the board in between grits to raise the grain. This helps to both eliminate ridges and it also helps when coming into contact with water so it won't raise it later on then either. I go up to 180 on everything starting at 60 grit and then when the board is actually glued up and together I'll go from 180 up all the way to 320. Since I have the bottom of the tray sorted out, I need to come up with the sides. So I head on back over to my table saw and cut four sides of the tray, each half inch thick and about two inches tall. But while I'm in the middle of running all these pieces through, my table saw decided to kick the breaker in my garage halfway through cutting a piece. So it's not sketchy at all when it's dark outside, the lights kick off with the breaker, and the saw is running right next to your hands. I go find the right breaker eventually and get it turned back on and then cut the last piece. Because the tray needs a place to be mounted, I decided to go ahead and dado the purple heart sides to support the bottom. I just set the saw blade to take about an eighth inch off for the channel. But because my saw blade is only an eighth inch wide, I needed to make two passes on each piece to accommodate the quarter inch bottom. I then head over to my miter saw and miter the edges at 45 degrees so that when they butt together they make a perfect 90 degree joint. This also gets rid of that dado by mitering these edges. I then pre-sand these pieces just like I did with the bottom to make finisher easy on, repeating the exact same steps, spraying in between and then going up to 180. I then dry fit the pieces to make sure everything is nice and snug and gluing up the corners only and set up clamps to make sure I had perfectly square fit up. The bottom piece basically just floats along that dado and it allows it to have room to expand and contract so it doesn't crack anything. 24 hours go by and I take the tray out of the clamps and give it a light sanding on the edges to take off any of that residual glue. I need to go ahead and strengthen the corners as the glued face of the mitered edges really isn't that strong and is liable to break or shift over time. So I decide to add splines to my mitered edges. I make two lines on each corner face where I want them to go and then I scribe a line on the corner using a tri-square to set my depth of the spline. I then head over to my table saw again and set the height of my blade using the tried and true method of just eyeballing it. I just need to make sure that the edge of the blade makes contact with both the top of my line and the bottom of it to give it a straight even cut. I then go ahead and add a stop block to make sure I don't cut through the corners and I send it home cutting two splines into each corner all around the piece. I end up ripping a couple of pieces of spalt of maple down on my table saw to use as a spline, cut them to size, and then glue them into the corners. Some of them needed a little bit of caressing with the dead blow hammer, but they all fit in pretty well. <laughs> 
I then needed something to grab onto my tea tray with. From the other serving trays I've seen, people just seem to cut finger holds into the side, but I wanted to add another dimension and angle to the board. So I decided to grab some more spalted maple out of the scrap pile and cut it to length. I ran them through the table saw to give it a half inch lip to mount on the top of the purple heart sides. I was debating on whether or not I should leave them square, but I was told by everybody that I asked not to do that. So I instead cut an angle on the grip handle, and I again used my tried and true method of just eyeballing it, because that's pretty much all I ever just do. <laughs> It was a little sketchy for me to hold on to it, and it was really close to the blade, so I decided just to CA glue another piece of plywood on top, coming in handy again. The farther away I can get my hand from the spinning death wheel, the better. I wasn't too worried about just gluing the handles to the top of the board because I was going to add some more support later on. I say that, but I ended up adding like a million clamps to each handle just to make sure it wouldn't go anywhere. The next day I removed all the clamps and cut off the excess blinds with a multi-tool. I then took a flush cut router bit and trimmed off all the splines with the edges of the board. One thing that I was really nervous about during this whole process was the coloration of the purple heart. Whenever it's first cut on my table saw or I sand it at any amount, um, it removes that oxidized layer and turns a dark brown color. I knew the coloration would come back, but I never liked seeing it turn completely brown and change colors like that. I wasn't thrilled with how simple the handles turned out, so I wanted to add a little something else to them. Since the splines were incorporated into the side pieces, I thought I would go ahead and add purple heart dowels to the handles. Functional and aesthetic, best of both worlds. I measured out the position of three dowels on each side at a quarter inch from the middle since that wall thickness is about a half inch. I then took the board over to my drill press to make sure the holes were perfectly centered and used a quarter inch forcing of it. I drilled out all six holes setting a stop distance of about three quarters of an inch. Then grabbed a scrap piece of purple heart and headed over the table saw to cut it slightly over a quarter inch. I then set it in my vise and rounded over the edges with my sander putting the piece in my drill and using the doweling jig with a chisel to make a smooth quarter inch purple heart dowel. Got a little smoky at the end there though. I then added glue to the dowels and the holes themselves and hammered them in, just cutting off the excess at the top and letting it sit and dry for another day. I then start the finishing process, sanding the whole piece over again. I work my way up from 180 all the way to 320 using a sheet sander so I don't create any divots since the pieces are so small now. I pop the grain in between grits so there are no ridges between the pieces and it's smooth to the touch. I then use mineral spirits to remove any sawdust trapped in between the grain and show any areas I might have missed while sanding. I then apply two coats of Odie's oil, which is a wax finish that is food grade safe when it's fully cured. You can really start to see all the color when Odie's is applied, especially the darker purple from the purple heart and the black spalting in the maple. Gives it a really stark appearance. Odie's also has a really nice citrus aroma to it as well. I make sure to go everything really well and even grab a cotton swab to get into those hard to reach places with the finish. And the finished product. This tea tray is still for sale on my Etsy, linked in the description below. Every purchase helps me get one step closer to living out of my parents' basement, so it's totally appreciated. Thanks everyone for watching. I'd also appreciate it if you all liked, commented, and subscribed for more woodworking content. Down in the comments, let me know what else you all would like to see. I'd even take a thumbs up emoji, and I'd reply right back with one. See you all next week.